2017 in my eyes was the best calendar year for video games in the past decade. It contains so many exceptional game releases that when trying to pin down my favorites of the last 10 years, I genuinely couldn't give a straight answer for 2017. Not only were there a ridiculous amount of big name releases that caught a lot of attention, there were just as many, if not more, phenomenal indie titles, multiple of which being so impressive that they would have easily placed in the top spot if they released any other year. This is a topic I've long been wanting to discuss, and I have a YouTube channel, so I figured I should finally get around to making a top 10 video. However, I felt restricting it to 10 would be a little too limiting, as even though a few of the lesser known games would make the cut, it still wouldn't really represent the year as I see it. I could probably pull a top 10 out of my ass for most years if I had to, but what separates 2017 from the rest is the sheer quantity of standout titles. That being the case, my genius idea was to expand the list to 25, an eye-catching number no doubt about it, but talking about 25 games in one video proves to be far too daunting of a task, so I'll instead only be talking about 20. I was able to keep the catchy title, however, as a handful of great YouTubers agreed to pick up my slack and take over for five of the numbers. I won't tell you who they are, you'll have to watch the video to find out. A few things to preface before I begin. First, I'm going off of the North American release dates. This is why Earth Defense Force 5 won't be appearing on this list since the year 2017 is when it released in Japan. Secondly, I won't be factoring in any early access dates either. I'm going off of when the 1.0 release was. Oxygen Not Included would have likely cracked the top 10, but its full 1.0 launch was in 2019, so you won't be seeing it here. Finally, just to state the obvious, this is my top 25. This list is in no way objective, it's all my opinion. I could also see it potentially changing in a couple of years, as there are quite a few 2017 games that I haven't gotten around to yet that I have high hopes for. I'll name those at the end, along with some honorable mentions that I have played that didn't make the cut, as well as a few other notable big hits that I simply don't have much interest in. Those are still important to mention, as it helps to show just how impressive this calendar year was for game releases. Okay, without further ado, welcome to the Top 25 Games of 2017. Hope you enjoy the show. Number 25. Hidden Folks is an adorable game of I Spy, where you're asked to find objects and people in a highly detailed hand-drawn landscape. While a static page on a paper can be a decent canvas when searching for Waldo, Hidden Folks takes advantage of the medium it's in by providing the player living miniature worlds for them to explore. Not only are the locales arranged in an eye-catching way, showcasing many contained stories all around, but you can interact with nearly every object in the environment. Perhaps you'll need to clear the thicket to unveil the panda you're looking for. Maybe you'll need to open the right suitcase, the right tent, clear a waterfall, or find where the pigs are, clear the weeds, then dig on the revealed X to find the hidden truffle. Although it may look like mashing the left mouse button all over would be an easy way to get through the game, the sheer size of the levels and the number of unique objects to click is enough to put a stop to that cheesy tactic. Even if you were to play it conservatively with your rapid clicks and focus on the more out-of-place areas, you still would likely waste more time than if you used your brain and worked out the solution yourself. While there are a good 10-15 to 15 things for you to find on every big map, the true number of hidden objects is probably a lot higher. If I had to guess, I'd say they likely hid close to 50 different folks and items, only selected a quarter of that big number, then created a clever hint about where those dozen or so are. Not only does this mostly curtail left-click spamming to get through the levels, it makes these areas feel like they have more going on than they would otherwise, not existing solely for the player. It also helps when you may feel frustrated that you got the answer wrong after a failed click. Yeah, you didn't find what you were looking for, but at least you were still treated to a funny gag. The audible acapella sound bites that accompany every click go a long way as well, making the environments feel even more alive. <laughs> <laughs> Hidden Folks is a delightfully simple game, one that's very easy to throw on when you want to relax a bit. They even have a night mode, just in case you wanted to play with the lights off. Number 24 
The Mummy Demastered is a Metroidvania, one that is seemingly based off of the Tom Cruise movie that came out that year, but thankfully nothing about the game hints at the idea that watching that film is even slightly necessary. While the interesting looking bosses are a little too simple, and the enemies themselves are the usual get-in-your-way types which plague the entire genre, what made The Mummy Demastered stand out for me was its military paint job. If you've watched videos on the channel before, you'll likely be aware that I'm simply not that interested in military shooty-shooty games. However, Metroidvanias don't really have much in that department. When I first began playing, what excited me most was seeing how the military aesthetic would handle certain tropes of the genre. Certain doors can't be opened without an upgrade, and that turned out to be varying types of explosives, such as the grenades for the wooden barricades and C4 for the metal ones. The max health increases are first aid kits of some kind, and the capacity upgrades are bandoliers. For your weaponry, you have your infinite ammo submachine gun, the assault rifle and shotgun which have their own ammunition, along with a few other, more unconventional choices such as the flamethrower, mercury harpoon, and a couple more I won't spoil here. Repelling down a narrow crevice is the equivalent to the elevators you'd find in Metroid, helicopter rides serve as your warp function, and what's even better is how it doesn't break consistency within the world, as they're only found on the topmost parts of the map closer to the surface. Even though it seems like half of the player base thought the game was too easy, you may very well fall into the opposing camp where the game feels too difficult. This wouldn't be worth mentioning if not for how the death mechanic works. When you die, your corpse becomes a zombified version of yourself, one that you have to kill to get all of your equipment back. On paper, the system sounds great. Because you're just a regular soldier who happened to find equipment and upgrades on the way, you're very replaceable. Every time you die, you're essentially sending another average person down into the cave to finish the job the previous soldier failed to do. Again, on paper, this is a unique way to make every death canonical, but in practice, this could mean slogging through areas with only one health bar and no other weapons besides your weak submachine gun. Once you finally get to your corpse, or corpses, if you're unlucky enough, you have to defeat your previously overpowered character, which now has all of the weapons and buffs you've collected so far, with your current underpowered character. It's very easy to see why some felt this wasn't a fun use of their time, but if you manage to avoid a long corpse run, I think you'll mostly have a good time with the Mummy Demastered. It's a short helping of Metroidvania, one with a gorgeous pixelated military aesthetic and a great soundtrack, which I've been playing in the background, of course. This certainly won't be the last time you hear about soundtracks, as holy shit 2017 is filled to the brim with exceptional music. Number 23 Subsurface Circular is a text-based adventure game, one that takes place entirely in the titular Subsurface Circular train car. You're a detective that takes on a case outside of their main workload, and through conversation, unravels the mystery of the missing techs. Techs in this world are robots, subservient to humans, and even follow Asimov's laws of robotics. In an attempt at spoiling as little as possible, I'll refrain from describing the world building and how it connects to the events the player partakes in, but I'll just say it's very intriguing and worth paying attention to. As a high-level detective, you'll talk to the many techs that board the train car you're geolocked to, searching for leads to uncover the truth. Certain techs may offer direct clues that aid the case, while others may be helpful in more abstract ways, such as providing a new talking point you can use with other techs, allowing for the player to obtain information they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. This can feel like a puzzle at times, where some keywords and discussion topics open the door for the next bit of gossip, which may lead to another metaphorical key for a different metaphorical door. The writing itself is fantastic, so every additional dialogue tree feels like a reward rather than another block of text you're forced to read. Like I said before, I'm not interested in spoiling the story or lore behind this world, as it's definitely best experienced firsthand, but what the game manages to do with the short amount of time it takes to play is really something commendable. I'd say one playthrough will take about an hour and a half, maybe two hours if you get stuck on some things or take it slow. I'm of the opinion that short games are just as valid as long ones, and I vastly prefer when a game doesn't waste my time and knows when to end. Considering how much enjoyment I've gotten out of the three and a half hours in total I've spent with this game, the $6 price tag is, if anything, too low. Number 22 Golf Story, at its heart, is a cozy role-playing game. 
While you do swing clubs and do the tried and true, but also contrived and generic swinging minigame that's in every golf game ever, the RPG side of Golf Story is what makes it special. You get to freely wander the golf courses of this world, interact with the environment, talk to NPCs, help them with silly side quests, complete minigames, and progress the main story. All the while, you get experience to level up your character, and the stats are handled in a somewhat unconventional way. For every point you place into the power of your swing, all other stats shift to the left. I say shift instead of lower, as it seems ideal to have those stats close to the middle, so you may find yourself raising a few above the optimal position before advancing your power once more. In line with the freedom you have when running around the course, you can choose to tee up anywhere you like, as well as throw golf balls at anyone you like or don't like. The addition of disc golf provides a nice bit of variety to the gameplay as well, and with how smoothly Golf Story transitions to those somewhat mechanically different sections, it has me excited for Sports Story all the more. The humor found through the dialogue I think is pretty great, however I could easily see it not landing for everyone. At the very least, the dynamic nature of the text itself enhances almost every NPC interaction. Golf Story is a delightful experience every step of the way, from its retro-inspired map system which replaces towns with golf courses, to its silly dialogue, classic pixel art, fun level design, and pleasant music selection. If nothing else, it's wholesome in a way that doesn't feel forced, a relaxing RPG that just so happens to involve golf. Number 21. After a decade of mostly subpar offerings in the series that coined the genre, Metroid fans finally got something worth playing in Metroid Samus Returns. Even though it wasn't strictly original, as it was a ground-up remake of Metroid 2, it still manages to stand on its own due to many new additions and tweaks. Hunting for Metroids is already a fun premise, and the hunter-prey dynamic can, at times, be very enjoyable. Even though the total number of bosses feels a bit inflated due to the many reuses of the same Metroid mutations, they do provide a mostly satisfying fight for what is essentially a collectible on the map. The regular collectibles are easier to find this time around thanks to the scanner, one of a few new abilities Samus has been endowed with this time around. The noise it makes when items are nearby is very annoying due to its high pitch, but at least the secrets hidden in walls don't feel as cheap as they used to. Samus can also now freely aim 360 degrees, which is nice, however the overemphasis of the new parry mechanic puts your regular shots mostly on the back burner. The parry is my least favorite part of Samus Returns, and it's not even close. Simply not using it isn't even a viable playstyle, as almost every enemy and boss takes way more damage per shot after a successful parry. That aside, the map itself is very fun to explore, hunting for Metroids is strangely addicting, and the upgrades are satisfying to acquire and utilize. Overall, not a worthwhile reason to cease and desist AM2R, as that game is superior, but still a great addition to the franchise, and far better than anything else with the series name in far too long. A return to the classic 2D Metroid that fans of the series were clamoring for. Number 20. Super Mario Odyssey! Speaking of returning to what fans were clamoring for, Mario Odyssey was the first 3D open world Mario game since Mario Sunshine. While the Galaxy games and 3D World were fantastic in their own ways, they didn't scratch an itch many players had for a game like Mario 64 or Sunshine. A 3D platformer with tight mechanics, fun ways to gain and keep momentum, and a plethora of moves at your disposal to help you traverse through a semi-open environment. Cappy is this game's version of Flood, just not as overpowered, thankfully. While the moves you can perform with him increase the skill ceiling and are enjoyable to pull off, what I find most interesting is how Nintendo added to the player's arsenal of actions by, essentially, removing something from Mario. His hat has always been there, why not let him throw it? Maybe in the next game, Mario will unlock a new ability by taking off his pants. Hey, they can't all be winners. While collecting moons isn't quite as satisfying as collecting stars was in previous games, and the sheer amount of them is pretty ridiculous, I won't pretend that I didn't have a great time exploring every nook and cranny of every world to discover them all. I would have liked to see more difficult platforming sections, 
more goals that were as challenging as the 100 jump rope moon, some more depth when it came to the hat transformations, and more engaging boss fights that aren't just these guys over and over. That being said, some of the bosses are pretty good, a few of the hat transformations are a worthwhile change of pace, and the 2D sections were a welcome addition, one I hope to see more of in future titles. Overall, Mario Odyssey is a good game, one deserving to be on this list, but I can't help but feel it was pretty overrated on release. No way on earth does this game come anywhere close to being as good as a few near the top of this list. Number 19 Speaking of overrated, Nier Automata was one of the standouts for me personally when 2017 was all said and done. I of course hadn't played even half of these 25 games at that point, but even still, at the time, it was solidly in my top 3. Over the years, it has slowly but surely sank lower and lower in my rankings. It still earns its right to be on this list though, as the world building, lore, themes, and story are all so unique and captivating in their own way. The altruistic side of me also appreciates that it likely got a few people out there to give other Platinum Games titles a proper go, such as Bayonetta, The Wonderful 101, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, Transformers Devastation, if they can find it somehow, and maybe even Astral Chain two years later. Not to beat a dead horse, but every one of those games is far better than Nier Automata where it matters most. The combat. The combat in Nier Automata is exceptionally mundane, to the point where I think it would be a better game if it were completely removed. The leveling system is also completely superfluous, and only serves to make certain enemies more damage spongy than others. Nier Automata is such a paradox for me, since so much of it is garbage, yet so much of it is interesting. The idea of playing twice through to see two different perspectives is awesome, but when the opening of the game and most of the main story missions are a slog, it can be pretty off-putting. The boss battles are a visual spectacle, but they're absolutely ass when it comes to a fun play experience. The shifts between genres is something I can definitely appreciate, but again, the execution falls completely flat, turning these sections into a chore. The shoot-em-up and side-scroller bits specifically feel really messy and long overstay their welcome. The implementation of the chip system to be in line with the settings menu is a really neat idea, and the fact that you can customize your HUD in all of these ways canonically is something that I wish more games would try. The focus on machines and androids instead of humans is so fascinating, as is the humanization of the machines, but the humanization itself is far too rushed, coming out of nowhere almost immediately, and the designs of the Yorha androids are particularly stupid. The open world is hauntingly beautiful, but also utterly tiresome to traverse, and fairly monotonous to explore. The soundtrack is one of the best of the year, and the true end credit sequence is likely something many will remember for quite some time. As you can see, I'm very split on Nier Automata. Some of it is great, some of it unique, some unorthodox, avant-garde, pretentious, and even outright bad. It's all of it. It would still earn a place on this list even if the stellar soundtrack and beguiling lore was all it had going for it, but I do think factoring in my first playthrough experience is perfectly valid, as that true ending really did get to me back when I was 24. My 29-year-old self feels differently, however, which is why I can't possibly fathom putting it ahead of anything else on this top 25. Number 18 Neo, much like Nier Automata, is a mixed bag. At its best, it provided the closest thing to a genuine Souls-like in the AAA video game space not made by FromSoft itself. The combat feels weighty, but not clunky. Every enemy can kill you if you aren't careful. Cautious exploration of your surroundings is highly encouraged. A few shortcuts can be unlocked to make getting back to where you died easier, even some as simple as opening a door from the other side. The shrines are a fun stand-in for bonfires, and many of the weapons offer varied movesets to set your playstyle apart from others. There are also quite a few unique qualities to Neo that make it more compelling than a simple copycat, such as the stance system, opening up even more attack variety on a moment-to-moment -moment level. The way your stamina works, with your key being able to be recovered by pressing the right bumper at the right time, is the first I've seen stamina used in such a way. It essentially functions like active reloads do in a few shooter games, which made me think of my key as this game's version of ammo, and I think that's very interesting. The way you can use key pulses to remove an area of Yokai Realm is also a really smart idea, 
both encouraging the use of the mechanic for those who haven't been using it, while also punishing a player for not staying on top of the stage control abilities many demons have. Being able to see the opponent's stamina bar is also something fairly noteworthy, as that knowledge is very helpful when knowing when to keep on the offensive or when to back off. The ranged weapons in Neo are a lot better than any dedicated bow or crossbow build the Souls games have come up with. You can't play the game with these weapons, but their purpose, which is to pick off a few enemies from far away, is a nice addition to the formula. The levels themselves may not be intertwined in a big cohesive world, but the main story missions have a lot of pretty environments to explore, and are more engrossing than I think a lot of people give them credit for. The same goes for the enemy variety. While I can easily admit that the same demons and humans show up in nearly every level, the idea of the yokai realm invading with an army of demons honestly is super cool. Finally, the Kodama are the best collectibles in any game I've ever played. Every five you gather in each region, which usually contains about three or four levels, increases your maximum elixir count by one. They also offer a handful of blessings, which up your chances at certain drops. That all takes a back seat, however, to just how fucking adorable they are. I mean, just look at them. Oh my god, they're so damn cute. All of that being said, Neo has a heaping pile of dog shit in it as well. The Diablo-esque loot drops are a huge pain in the ass, the amount of clutter in your inventory verges on satire at times, the many ways to incrementally improve your equipment is just a hassle, many enemy ambushes are placed in annoying choke points for the sole purpose of killing players unfairly, the boss battles, while mostly okay, get ridiculous later on as the side missions just start clumping them together for some reason, and the ludicrous amount of grinding you may have to do to keep your level at the proper sweet spot is just out of this world. This means you'll likely spend so much more time in missions you've already completed, just so you can have a chance at not getting one-shotted by every enemy in the next piece of content. This unfortunately stretches the game's length out to an inconceivable level. I've played the game once through, not even finishing all of the shitty double boss side missions, and haven't touched any of the DLC, and I apparently put over 100 hours into the game. Every FromSoft game besides Elden Ring took between 20 and 40 hours at most, and all of them, even Demon Souls, have more worthwhile levels, enemies, and bosses. It's such a shame, since when you're properly leveled to match the enemies you're going against, I'd say Neo surpasses every combat system From has put out, besides maybe Sekiro. The stances, key management, and many different abilities at your disposal add a lot of depth to the tried-and-true Souls-like combat system. For that reason alone, it earns its place on this list. And, you know, the Kodama are adorable, like I said. Number 17. Pretty much any time that Zaktronic Studios decides to release a game, you can be pretty certain it's going to be one of that year's standout titles, and in 2017 it was no different when Zaktronics released Opus Magnum. Opus Magnum is a puzzle problem solving game about alchemy, where you spend your time designing fantastic contraptions to grab, twist, rotate, translate, and combine elements together. It has all the staples of classic alchemy, turning lead into gold, producing airship fuel, or making a hangover cure for a workplace superior. Okay, maybe not entirely classic. The visual design is superb. There's a sense of magic in here, while all the arms and tracks and pistons still feel weighty and tangible. You control these mechanisms with a form of visual coding, placing blocks of instructions in a list to tell each of your moving parts exactly what to do and when to do it, transforming individually simple components into well-oiled machines of production that are simply mesmerizing to watch. Piecing together these intricate systems is intensely engaging, and the challenge is made even deeper because Opus Magnum's levels don't have one right answer. The contraption I design to form an element won't be the one that you design, and while both are good, one might be more good in different ways. This does form the right compound, but this forms it just that bit faster. Just solving a level is not the end, because there are going to be ways to make your system better, like building the cheapest machine that you can. I call this one underpaid retail employee operating an entire warehouse. Shouldn't have made that joke, this guy's gonna get me cancelled. Opus Magnum is arguably Zaktronic's most accessible title. Finding a solution isn't too difficult, but finding optimal solutions adds a level of self-driven challenge that can have you engaged for hours. 
Zachtronics is more than just a studio, it is an entire genre that is well worth delving into, and with Opus Magnum being one of that genre's best starting points, it is a fine addition to 2017's Arsenal. Number 16 Splatoon 2 is the sequel to Splatoon 1, and other than a few new weapon types and modes, there's not that much difference between the two. Besides not being as novel the second time around, Splatoon is still one of my favorite online multiplayer games to this day. Shooting ink instead of bullets is already a huge plus, as so many other developers don't think twice about if their next game should be about murdering other humans. But to then have the main game mode of Splatoon be about painting the floor? That's just fantastic. How Nintendo got the act of painting the ground to be enjoyable in and of itself is truly commendable stuff. Even more, they clearly put a lot of thought into how the visual designs and gameplay would intersect, as the squids don't exist for no reason, it's to make the transition between walking around normally and swimming in ink more understandable. Given that painting the ground is the de facto method of victory, it's also great that it has strategic purposes, as you get damaged and can't swim in the opponent's ink, and swimming in your color is how you reload your weapons. Truly, Splatoon is way more interesting than nearly every other shooting game to exist. While the campaign is just as much of a mixed bag as the first game's attempt, the Octo Expansion DLC that came out a year later more than makes up for it. However, that isn't a 2017 release, so I have to ignore that for this video. Sorry. What really makes Splatoon 2 stand out is the newly added Salmon Run, which is Splatoon's take on the classic Horde mode. Even though there are only three waves every run, completing all three is a genuinely intimidating task, as the enemies are relentless. The boss variants all having some unique weak points allows them to stand out so much more than they would otherwise, and the sheer number of them makes every wave a frantic dash to collect the golden eggs. The variety on offer, through the different map rotations, loadout choices, high or low tide stage alterations, and special waves that randomly spring up from time to time are really what makes this game mode so easy to come back to. Salmon Run is by far the best thing about Splatoon 2 as a whole, and its inclusion alone justifies the existence of this sequel. Overall, a fantastic game, even if the many weapons you have to pick from in the online are arbitrarily locked to certain sub-weapons and specials. Hopefully we'll see that removed in Splatoon 3, but I'm not holding my breath. Number 15 What Remains of Edith Finch is a story-driven game and one of the best in the medium. What it manages to do, and the story it's able to tell in the two hours it takes to complete, is really something special. The eponymous Edith takes a pilgrimage to her old childhood home, one that would be extremely odd to anyone who didn't grow up there. The reason she goes back is to finally uncover and understand the curse that haunts her family name, the same supposed curse that has left her as the only remaining Finch alive. You walk around this mausoleum of past tragedies, and hear, watch, and play through the final moments of every family member. The gameplay and art style shift to match each story, and that's one of the reasons this is such an easy game to recommend. Walking around for two hours at a slow pace can be very off-putting for some people. I'll be the first to admit that the misnomered walking simulator genre isn't one I often spring to when I pick a game to play. What got me to stick around with Edith Finch were the constant shifts to a slightly different style. Light platforming as an animal, photography in the forest, smacking your boyfriend with a crutch in a comic book, and having a dance party with some bath toys. It's nothing that will seriously test your skills or anything, but it's enough to keep someone's attention who otherwise might have lost interest, and it may even lull them into a sense of mechanical comfort right before an emotional moment sucker punches them in the face. One of the best qualities of Edith Finch is how, even though it might appear initially that Edith talks about everything important around you, like you're playing Life is Strange or something, there's actually a surprising amount of environmental storytelling that is very easy to miss. The narrative isn't as simple as it may seem on the surface, and some of the lingering questions a player might have could be answered by stopping to investigate things that Edith didn't comment on. The house itself is also utterly captivating. Even if there wasn't a great story to go along with it, exploring this abandoned castle is enthralling in a way, as you're unlikely to see anything else like it. What Remains of Edith Finch was able to provide me with something that so many other stories in this medium don't. 
an unpretentious, genuinely emotional story that doesn't overstay its welcome. Number 14. X-Morph Defense is a tower defense twin-stick shooter hybrid where you play as the X-Morph, an alien species that invades Earth to harvest its resources. Normally, the roles would be reversed, so the fact that you get to play as the villains of this conflict is already a worthwhile and fun change of pace. Like any other tower defense game, you're able to construct specific towers to fend off certain enemy types, but what appealed to me the most was its electric fence mechanic. You're able to place your towers almost anywhere you like on the battlefield, and if they're close enough, you can create a fence interlocking them. This allows you to fine-tune the pathways the enemy forces will have to take, and later on, you can even knock down parts of the surrounding environment to close off natural openings without using your resources. This is by far the best part of X-Morph Defense, and I kind of wish it was something to be expected of games in the genre to be honest. While you could spend 10 minutes between each wave strategizing on how to best counter the next batch of enemies, you can also keep most of it the same in favor of wanting a higher grade at the end, using the twin stick shooting to get the stragglers. I definitely think it's a positive that this is even an option, that if you really don't like the top-down shooting, you can mostly ignore it, and if you enjoyed it, you can lean into it. The upgrades kind of go along with this idea as well, but it's not a perfect system for reasons I won't get into here. The worst part of the game, without question from me, is the scrap system. Eventually, you'll be able to collect scrap from defeated enemies, which, in turn, provides a modicum amount of tower-constructing energy. This is another facet of the grading system, for some reason, and if you really want to get the highest rank, you might find yourself constantly in ghost mode, spamming tiny circles around the battlefield. Not only does this discourage players from taking part in the twin-stick shooting side of things, even if they're having a good time with it, but also, going into ghost mode to collect the debris turns the battlefield into a complete mess, so you barely get to bask in the visual of your towers doing their jobs. Ignoring that, the premise of the game is awesome, the boss fights are fun, and the graphics are fucking incredible, and given how I barely ever mention the word graphics on this channel, that should say something. This is one of the 10 games on this list that I predict I'll be talking about more in the future, and if you can guess the other 9 correctly in the comments, you are a prophet whose power knows no bounds. As a hint to those brave few who try, just because I've talked about a game on the channel before doesn't mean I won't talk about it again. Okay, moving on. Number 13. Doki Doki Literature Club is a remarkable piece of art. To anyone unfamiliar, it may just look like a cutesy visual novel dating simulator, and given that those types of games are aimed at a very specific demographic, most people would be turned off right away. Due to word of mouth and its price tag, this visual novel became a viral phenomenon, causing a myriad of players out there who would have never touched a game like this to give it a shot. If the Steam tags, or the incessant pleas from their friends to play it, it's totally worth it, didn't tip them off, the disturbing content warning popping up at the start may have done the trick. This is a psychological horror game satirizing a run-of-the-mill anime-inspired visual novel. Because some of the horror visuals are genuinely disturbing, I won't show any of it on screen. What's so special about Doki Doki is the fact that the twist of it being a horror game isn't used as a crutch to carry you through the end. Even after the reveal, the game has plenty more tricks up its sleeve, and for the sake of anyone who hasn't played this yet, I won't spoil those here. Playing the game again for this video four years after my first playthrough really made me appreciate it all the more. It's pretty impressive how many of the lines of dialogue take on a different meaning, and how the slow-paced beginning isn't boring this time around, but instead filled with dread. There are a few moments in particular that play on the expectations of players who know what they're getting themselves into, like the fearing the sudden shift into madness is right around the corner. At least, that's how I felt on my second playthrough, as even though I knew what was going to happen, I didn't know when it was going to happen, and that's almost worse. The ending is one of the more memorable experiences I've had with video games as a whole, and the soundtrack is annoyingly catchy. Overall, Doki Doki is a really clever title that managed to break through the ceiling of its genre to reach an enormous audience. I'd highly recommend it to anyone out there, but with a gigantic asterisk that you look into some of the disturbing topics in the game and judge for yourself if you'd be able to stomach it. Seriously. Number 12. 
Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is the most astounding game you probably haven't played. I mean, what even is this game? It has no tutorial, no HUD, no pop-up hints, no inventory, no leveling, no health bars, and we've only just begun. The story is non-linear and told through out-of-sequence flashbacks, the world distorts and fractures around you, Oversaturated colours and auditory hallucinations assault your senses. It's a lot. This game isn't for the faint of heart. The horrors of the human psyche, the demons of childhood trauma, the frights of psychosis, Hellblade throws you head first into all of it. And yet, it's never cliched, reductive, or exploitative. It isn't afraid to traverse the darkness at the heart of the human soul, but it's ultimately a life-affirming story about overcoming grief and confronting your fears, a story in which stigma and shame are the real monsters, and true heroism is the inner strength wielded by those who have to battle mental illness every day. Yes, the combat is satisfying, yes, the artistic design is drop-dead gorgeous, and yes, the Norse mythology is cool, but the reason Hellblade is a masterpiece is that it's more than the sum of its parts. It's one of the most empathetic portrayals of psychosis and mental illness survivorship ever put to screen, it's proof of how special video games can be when they truly marry technological and narrative innovation, and most importantly, it's an invitation to see the world a little bit differently. Number 11 Persona 5 was one of the biggest surprises for me, as not only had I never played a game in the series before this one, I generally detest turn-based RPGs. While I will admit the game is far too long, the first few hours are way too slow, and much of the dialogue overall feels like a waste. I mean seriously, how many times do we have to hear from Kawakami that she doesn't want to be the player's teacher? Beyond those few pacing issues, the game is enjoyable on a level I personally hadn't seen before in the JRPG genre. The One More and Baton Pass mechanics are a good example, as they helped transform the usual turn-based gameplay into something more palatable and dynamic. Receiving an extra turn for using the right elemental attack is already great, but to then be able to pass that One More over to an ally for bonus damage, only for them to pass their extra turn to a third party member for even more, is a really neat way to involve everyone in your group while also encouraging strategic use of your personas. Everything surrounding the personas themselves is extremely interesting, from the negotiation process with the demons after a battle to convince them to join your side, to squishing two of them together later on, sacrificing both to create something even better. It's basically Pokemon for grown-ups, in the sense that I doubt kids would want to murder their Squirtle or Charizard to get something stronger. The anime school simulator side of the game is definitely something I thought I wouldn't like at all, but it ended up being a lot more than filler. The characters you meet are expressive and entertaining, and the choices you'll make on how to spend your free time have lasting consequences. All of that paired with the overarching time limit of when you need to complete certain dungeons so as to stay on track with the narrative, Persona 5 manages to add stakes to just about every seemingly mundane decision you make. The dungeons and mementos as a whole are very fun to explore, and I especially like the Morgana van you drive around in. The soundtrack is phenomenal, the story has enough twists and turns to satisfy just about anyone out there, and the UI is in its own echelon of greatness, as no other game has menus this stylish. Persona 5 is very easy to recommend, both for RPG veterans and for those like me who aren't normally fans of the genre. It certainly would be nice if this came to the PC, as keeping it locked to the PlayStation even after five years have passed is awfully silly. If God of War can make the transition, why not Bloodborne? I I mean, Persona 5. <clears throat> uh, anyway, next game. Number 10. Pyre is the third game to come from Supergiant Games, the developer now most known for their 2020 release, Hades. 
Out of all four of Supergiant's games, Pyre seems to be the black sheep, not as often talked about or mentioned, unless you're just starting out your channel that is, with no experience at recording or sweetening your audio, don't understand the basics of editing or mixing your sound, and overall have no comprehension on how to not sound like a boring professor. Yeah, my hour-long Pyre video is not one I'd recommend watching. I almost feel like I did the game a disservice with how poor it all is, so let me try to set the record straight with this little recommendation for Pyre. Pyre is a very unique game. Half of it feels like a visual novel, while the other half is some sort of magical basketball league. Plunging the orb into the opposing side's flame is how you score, and the many nuances to offense and defense give the game more depth than it may appear on the surface. The winners of the basketball league get to save one of their teammates from the purgatory hellscape known as the Downside, the place you've all been exiled to. Every character has a backstory and a reason to get back home, yet you'll soon realize that not everyone can go back. You're the one who has to pick who gets freedom, and that choice gets more and more difficult as the game goes on. Not only do you lose that companion's company in the visual novel half, thus potentially missing out on learning their backstory, you also lose them as a teammate in the sports part as well. This means saving your favorite character is a double-edged sword. If the most endearing party member, who you believe deserves salvation more than any other, is how you keep winning games, freeing them early on may cost you more chances at freeing others. Losing is part of the experience, and the game has clever ways of making you second-guess your goal of remaining undefeated. The downside itself, and the lore behind it all, is captivating. The visuals of the game bring that intriguing lore to life with the gorgeous environments you travel through, as well as with the stages, which more often than not, contain a remnant of the bygone titans in the background. The soundtrack is personally my favorite of the year, and the way the end credit song lines up with the story and your party members is truly something special. I would heavily recommend going out of your way to give Pyre a full playthrough. As a complete experience, I'd say it's just as good as Hades, if not better. Number 9 Rivals of Either is a very easy game to describe. Imagine competitive Super Smash Bros. Melee, replace the bubble shields with a parry, replace the ledge grabs with wall jumps, and remove the grab mechanic. As simple as it is, having a genuine Smash-like on PC to play with your friend online was such a fantastic thing to behold. A few other games have tried, but Rivals was the only one to offer the depth and speed that rivaled competitive Melee. Characters all have tilts, strong attacks, and air attacks in every direction, and four special moves. Wave dashing, among other advanced moves, are part of the game's core mechanics, and even show up in the tutorials. The designs of the fighters themselves are so unique, both in terms of visuals and in regards to gameplay. While Smash Bros. eventually started giving characters fun gimmicks that separated them from the rest, every fighter in Rivals has a very distinct moveset. Krag hits hard and has a love for rocks, Sylvanos has crazy melee range and controls the stage with his grass, Edelus does the same thing with his ice, either sliding around or freezing enemies with his butt. Rano has his tongue, which can zip him around the stage and trap opponents in bubbles. Zetterburn has more knockback on his strong attacks when his opponent is on fire. Raster only has aerial strong attacks. And Orcane shoots out puddles that act as his recovery attack and a type of stage control. Even the guest characters, Ori and Shovel Knight, have special mechanics from their respective games. Ori has his bash ability as his down special, even able to bash his own balls of light. Shovel Knight can combo his down air much like he can in his game. And of course, every one of his attacks spits out treasure, which you can spend on armors and tools mid-game by using the taunt button. While competitive one-on-one -on -one is where the game really shines, you can play with up to three friends as well, even on stages that have a hazard to balance the scales a bit. There's a classic-style story mode for six of the characters, Abyss mode, which is reminiscent of the multi-fighter battles in Smash Bros, with a few other gimmicks thrown in, and there's even a... Tether Ball mode. Huh. Overall, if you have any interest in the more competitive side of platform fighters like Smash Bros, this game definitely deserves a try. Number 8 
thank you. When my boy DA reached out and asked if I wanted to cover a game on his list, I immediately knew I had a moral obligation to talk about Cuphead. I mean, look at me. Cuphead is definitely one of the more ambitious video game projects to come out in the last few years. All the animation is done on ones. A full 24 frames per second is animated, and each character stretches and uh, kind of like does that looping thing that Fleischer cartoons used to do. Other parts of the style, like the actual watercolor backgrounds and subtle film grain, make this a perfect tribute to classic rubber hose cartoons of the 1930s and 40s, this time with 100% less blackface. Cuphead presents a lot of its own ideas though. The main duo looks distinct and memorable, giving off comfy Mickey Mouse and Mario Brothers vibes. Each of the boss characters have distinct designs, and obviously their moves make them distinct characters in their own rights. A lot of personality comes through here. And the soundtrack, oh! The soundtrack. As a certain DreamWorks character once a big quoted, you like jazz? And I think I would have to say that I do. Literally every boss theme in this game is the best big band song I've ever heard in my life. The gameplay is quick, fast paced, and snappy. The running and gunning never gets tiring, and with the amount of times you'll get close to beating a boss only to be a picometer from bashing its stupid inflatable face in, it keeps you going until the credits. This game also has some surprisingly dark and kind of grotesque animation in it, which is also emblematic of that era in animation. If there was anything in this game I really don't like, honestly, I get peeved off by the plane levels. The ground levels all feel very balanced with their attack patterns, but personally, I find the bullet hell to be ramped up to an annoying degree during these stages. Now, I beat the game, obviously. This isn't the Dark Souls of anything as far as I'm concerned, but when we're listening to my personal anxiety, I just feel they went a teensy bit overboard during the plane stages. Other than getting slightly overwhelmed, Cuphead is a great challenging game that exudes charm and effort in every aspect of its design and art direction. Its popularity is more than deserved, and with it becoming a pop culture phenomenon, receiving both a TV show and fully animated DLC this year alone, I cannot wait to see how Studio MDHR tries to follow it up. I think they said they want to make a Zelda-like or something, which would be awesome. Now that's all I have to say. Goodbye. Number 7 this is where the list gets extremely tight. Every one of these remaining seven, as well as Cuphead, are genuinely some of my favorite games of all time now. These are the eight I was referencing in my tweet, and for all intents and purposes, I wouldn't really be upset if they landed in any other order. Because this list needs to have a defined ranking, I had to make some tough choices, but it should go without saying, I highly recommend every single one of these games. Prey is an immersive sim akin to System and Bioshock, you start with a wrench as your first weapon, so you would know I'm not lying. You're set loose in Talos 1, a space station orbiting the moon, one that has very recently been all but taken over by the invasive species known as Typhon. The Typhon come in a few different forms, such as the Phantoms and Mimics. The Mimics themselves are one of the most clever bits of game design I've ever seen, especially when you factor in the Recycler. The Mimics can take on the form of any random object in their immediate environment, such as a stool or a mop bucket. This might implant doubt in players' heads as they walk around, and they may catch themselves swinging at inanimate objects simply because they looked out of place. This means that the many decorative assets littered around, the ones that wouldn't impact anything in most other games, are now part of the experience. The Recycler helps with this as well, as you can utilize any miscellaneous grabbable item and turn it into certain forms of material, which you can then use in the Fabricator to make ammo, health packs, and many more helpful items. Since you can hold on to the food you grab, either using it later to incrementally heal you, or recycling it along with other junk to get more material, it makes much more sense for the main character of this adventure to be compulsively grabbing every food and drink item they come across. The levered skill you can acquire also aids the idea that everything in your environment is part of the experience. Once you upgrade it to 2 or 3, you can throw around big blocky objects that would normally just serve to get in your way in other games. Playing through Prey is like playing the best parts of Bioshock, but the whole time. One of the first things the game tries to teach players is that there are multiple ways to accomplish a certain goal. Search for the keycard to open the door, or find an alternate path. This isn't just a ham-fisted either-or button prompt, and it's not just for advancing to the next piece of structured content. This mentality is carried over to nearly every facet of the game. From taking on the imposing phantoms, getting into certain locked rooms, and even figuring out how to climb to a higher floor. Prey mixes its freely interactable environment with incredibly interesting tools to create a world where any solution that works is the right one. Elevator broken? Use your glue gun, which normally incapacitates enemies, to create a set of protruding stairs for you to climb. Giant immovable objects blocking your way to a secret stash of items? 
Upgrade your leverage to move them out of the way, or use your recycler grenade to turn that blockade into usable cubes of material. An enemy is too tough for you to take one-on-one? -on -one? Go back to that turret you saw a while ago and utilize it to your advantage, or maybe throw an explosive canister at them as they're walking over a gas bill to set them ablaze. This is everything that you can do in the first few hours of the game. There's so much more to pray than what I've shown here, and it both increases in scope and maintains its freedom of interactivity the whole way through. Prey is too good a game for me to spoil any more than I have, so I'll just say, I highly recommend giving this game a proper go, especially if you've enjoyed the Bioshock series in the past. This is so much better than those games, and that isn't a knock on Bioshock, it's just a testament to how incredible Prey is. Number 6 Rain World is quite literally one of the most unique gaming experiences I've ever had. I realize the way I'm describing some of these games may be coming off as hyperbolic, but I really do mean it. In Rain World, you play as a slug cat, a squishy mess of a creature that got separated from their family, forced to survive this dangerous landscape all on their own. Survive being the key word here, as even though on the surface it may resemble a Metroidvania-type game, it's nowhere near as hospitable. Slugcat is firmly on the lower end of the food chain in this world, and is prey to many of the creatures found wandering the environments. You need food, just like every other organism that inhabits these lands, so you'll need to explore to find sustenance to stay alive, flying mosquito bugs and berries being one of the first bits of food Slugcat will come across. Conversely, those aren't what the wandering lizards eat, they hunt for bigger targets such as Slugcat. One of Rain World's most gripping components is the emergent gameplay on offer. This seems to be a quality I hold in high regard, as Prey, along with a few others on this list, offer similar sensations. While these games do have more structure to them than, say, Minecraft or other open-world sandbox games, they also allow their worlds to exist and run without the player's input. To better explain what I'm talking about, let's go back to Neo again. Remember when I complained about enemy ambushes that seemed to only exist to kill players unfairly? Those were put there deliberately for that function, and will remain there as a set piece until the player walks by. While Prey does have a few of these rigid set piece moments, it also has the opposite, like when the operator you dispensed earlier to heal your wounds is now wandering through the same space you watched the quasi cutscene play out. Rain World has moments that resemble a deliberately placed set piece as well, but it would be very difficult to say with 100% certainty that those moments aren't just the game letting the world play out with no restrictions. Every individual person's playthrough of Rain World will be distinct in some way, thanks mostly in part to the behaviors of the creatures that inhabit this world. Their AI has a lot of independence, and they appear to have certain goals of their own. They can even fight with each other in the hopes of being the one and only King Lizard, the one that gets to take Slugcat to their hidey hole. Close to the end of the day, a lizard could be very far from their home, meaning if you happen to get caught and supposedly die from their grasp, don't give up hope! They could very well encounter a rival lizard on their trek back, and you'll, in turn, be freed. I'm serious, that actually is something that can happen. The biggest hurdles players have with Rain World is figuring out what to do, and withstanding the onslaught of unfairness and cheap deaths that are thrown their way. To offer some bit of advice for first-time players, Slugcat can utilize items found on the ground, like spears for example. The hibernation room is the equivalent to a save room, and it isn't always a horrible idea to hibernate the moment you have four pieces of food. The symbols on the left shift up every successful hibernation and go down every death. This is important to pay attention to, as your current symbol is what dictates if you're allowed to enter a new area or not. This means that simply staying alive and finding a place to sleep for the night is enough to satisfy the game's expectations of the player. Every location has its pros and cons, and some environments are harder to live in than others. On paper it sounds simple, almost too simple, but the world is unforgivingly harsh. Death is always right around the corner, and it might not always seem fair. Friendlies are few and far between, and it feels like everything wants to kill you. This sense of hopelessness may very well persist after a dozen or so hours of playtime, even after you've come to grips with Slugcat and advanced through many areas. You have to accept that simply staying alive as prey is the game. Don't get me wrong, there is an ending, there are points of interest that will carry you along the narrative the game has, but because those are either abstract or many hours into the game, 
that won't be what convinces players to keep going. There's a reason this starting area is the one you always see during recommendations of this game. There are close to 20 different regions in Rain World, but because they're all so interesting, so utterly breathtaking in their own ways, simply stumbling across one of them yourself evokes a feeling that most YouTubers have the good sense not to spoil. Some are so unique, I still, to this day, haven't seen anything else quite like it, which is why, of course, I can't show them to you. It would feel like I'm robbing something from prospective players. That might sound dramatic, but ask other fans of Rain World and they'd likely say something similar. This game has a cult following for a reason. It's an experience like no other, one that every gamer out there should give a try. Once again, I urge anyone who has even a slight interest in what I've shown so far to give this game a go. There really isn't much else like it. Number 5 One of the joys I have playing video games is the art of exploration, but specifically discovery. Uncovering secrets, narrative revelations, or just a whole new section of the map. Hollow Knight excels in all of these areas. The map is huge! Even near the end of my first playthrough, I was still uncovering new zones, and as Hollow Knight evokes this somber yet luscious tone with its environmental art, the character art being mostly cute, each new area is a distinct delight. The little chime that sounds each time you find a secret area adds to the joy of discovery. There's just so much packed into this world that even on a second playthrough, I was in awe of the game's scale. That the game is able to create this sense of awe and wonder that overshadows how difficult it can be to play is a miracle all by itself. Hollow Knight is hard. It takes inspiration from the Soul series, and you'd think being a 2D game, there'd be less opportunity for difficulty, well, you'd be wrong. Some of the boss fights are maddening. Now, the game employs a charm system, allowing you to deck out your knight with all kinds of different magical and physical boons, and this combined with the magic system gives the player a much easier time. But also, like the Soul series, most of this is either discovered by consulting a guide or on one second playthrough. I only found out how powerful magic was by watching the Hollow Knight speedrun at AGDQ after I had finished the game. It made me want to play it again. I still want to go back and play Hollow Knight again. After all this time, Hollow Knight still has its hooks in me. I think that's the mark of a great game. Number 4 Next Machina is one of the best twin-stick shooters of all time. I know that might sound insane to hear, considering that I placed this ahead of Prey, Hollow Knight, and Rain World. An arcade score attack game is better than those phenomenal experiences? Well, not exactly. While Next Machina doesn't offer anything close to what the previous three games do, it's unrivaled as a twin-stick shooter. Since making my Geometry Wars video way back when I had 20 subscribers, I've really made an effort to play as many twin-stick shooters as I could. I even gave the original Geometry Wars and Project Gotham Racing a spin. While there are plenty more that I've discovered that I hope to one day recommend, nothing touches Next Machina when it comes to its gameplay fluidity, to its adventure-like way you travel through the levels, to its climactic boss fights, to its engaging scoring mechanics, to its plethora of hidden secrets, to its great soundtrack, and finally, to its intrinsically fun twin-stick shooter foundation. I've already made a recommendation video for Next Machina that you can watch here, so I won't rattle on as long as I have for the previous games. Even though it might seem extremely out of place that Next Machina is so high up on this list, that should tell you how good I think this game is. <laughs> Jesus Christ, is that not the most redundant thing to say? This is a top 25 list, obviously that's what it means. What are you talking about? Number 
Darkwood may have come out in 2017, but it's still a fantastic horror game with nothing else really like it. You're cast into the strange world of a Polish forest, which is slowly being consumed by something. The exact nature of the threat is kept mysterious, and you could beat one of the game's endings without fully understanding what was happening. You still have the more obvious threats like the locals and their dogs. Darkwood makes you live in these haunted woods. There are survival game elements like crafting and upgrades, but it's still kept pretty light. The game wants you to focus on the atmosphere and the direct terrors over something more mundane like a hunger meter. There's a great focus and exploration with plenty of side stuff to discover, but every night you'll need to return to whatever holdout you found and hold back the horrors. It's in these sections especially that you can appreciate how amazing the sound design is. The art design is already fantastic, but the audio just brings it to a whole new level. It's only a matter of time until the things that go bump in the night start bumping at your door. If you like slow-burning horror games that don't rely on things like jump scares, this is definitely a game for you. It has fun risk-reward gameplay, an intriguing story, and it'll make you beg for the mornings. Before Mario and Metroid would release in the fall, what kicked the year off was the resurgence of another beloved franchise, Resident Evil. Resident Evil 7 is the first mainline game in the series that even comes close to resembling the PlayStation 1 horror classics. Since RE3 launched in 1999, we had quite a few spin-offs, a great remake, a phenomenal shooter adventure game, a satisfactory co-op shooter, a downtrodden mess, and then… nothing. Seemingly inspired by PT, RE7 set out to recapture the magic of wandering through an evil residence filled with monsters and other horrors. The perspective has always been third person for the mainline Resident Evil games, which is why the sudden shift to first person is a pretty jarring departure. Once you factor in the ability to play the game in VR, for some reason exclusive to the PlayStation, it makes much more sense. The first person viewpoint enhances the horror set piece moments, but if I'm being perfectly honest, I think those moments are some of the worst the game has to offer. Truly, what Resident Evil 7 excels at is going back to the basics. I mentioned this in my Luigi's Mansion video. Holy crap, that was a long time ago. Anyway, what I said still holds true. There's something captivating about exploring a huge building like a mansion. Slowly making progress, unlocking rooms one at a time, and finally exploring it all is immensely satisfying. When I wrote that, I was thinking of the Resident Evil games, specifically the remake of 1. While I do hold Resident Evil 4 near and dear to my heart, in terms of exploration, being set loose in a big building with secrets, locked rooms, and monsters is otherworldly enjoyable, to the point where I get excited just thinking about it. RE7 evoked that same feeling, the one I didn't think was possible the franchise could ever reclaim. The environments you get to explore are paced exceedingly well, and I feel like this is something a lot of people don't agree with me on. You begin in the guest house, a small contained area that is essentially a tutorial, However, it really doesn't feel like it when playing, as it's the same thing as the main game, just a smaller helping. You're then taken to the main house, where you'll spend a few hours understanding the layout, exploring for keys and secrets, and avoiding your overbearing father figure. Once a certain spoiler thing happens, you then gain access to the yard and the old house, which may or may not help you in fully exploring the main house once more. Finally, the testing area opens up, which is the most straightforward of the areas so far. If you want to avoid endgame spoilers, not the movie, Plug your ears until after I show Mia on screen again, like this. I'll even do a countdown for you. I can't show examples, but if you've played the game, you also know there's the wrecked ship, where you play as Mia in the past, then in the present. I've seen a lot of people online criticize this, saying it killed the pacing and ruined the game for them. That is something I thought initially, but after my second playthrough, it was one of the best parts of the game in my eyes. The ship is the most vertically oriented map the player has seen so far, and they get to experience two different variations of it. A first glimpse of the wreckage while they're basically defenseless, a flashback where they have more firepower while also getting to see what the map looked like before it all happened, and finally, the player is then allowed to explore the whole ship themselves, for real this time, after having already experienced the previous iteration of it. It feels just as self-contained as the opening guest house, which is why it's even cooler that you get to keep all the items you've collected after it's all said and done. The way you get to experience that same message from Mia that caused the events of the game to take place from the other perspective is also extremely interesting. 
That's all I'll say about the environments and the pacing, but what's even better than all of that is Madhouse difficulty. Upon completing the game, Madhouse is unlocked, and it's so much more than a few health-boosted enemies. This is what sets Resident Evil games apart from others, at least the best ones, as you're able to get that first playthrough experience twice. You can usually play as one of two characters, and both of their runs will be somewhat similar, but also somewhat distinct from each other. This might sound like the criticism I levied against Nier Automata, but the difference here is the gameplay of Resident Evil lends much better to replayability than Nier's does. In RE7, instead of two separate characters, Madhouse takes on the role of providing a somewhat similar, somewhat different playthrough. Spoiling all of the changes here would be completely missing the point, so I'll just say, if you've played RE7 before and haven't touched Madhouse, you should definitely give it a try. Mia is very hard to take down in the guest house, but once you've done that, it's not too bad. I also have to quickly praise the DLC of Resident Evil 7. While I don't personally like when content is released in bite-sized chunks, at this point it's all available, which is how I experienced it. The 21 card game and the survival tower defense-esque nightmare were by far my favorites from this batch of DLC. Ethan Must Die is a cool idea, but is the only one I haven't been able to finish yet, Not A Hero is incredibly overrated, and The End of Zoe is a decent enough little bit of gameplay in its own right. As a whole, Resident Evil 7 is astoundingly impressive. To think Capcom can salvage a nearly dead franchise and return it to its former glory. If only they could work their magic with a certain other game series, am I right? <laughs> On that note... Number 1 Dead Rising 4 is the perfect series finale to Dead Rising and gave fans everything they could have possibly wanted out of the final game in the series. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You saw the thumbnail. You know what game hasn't been talked about yet. Alright, sorry. Here we go. Number 1 The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is blah 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 blah. Look, I know everyone and their mother has made a video on this game, so I won't bore you with another surface level explanation and review. Arg, the weapons break. Arg, not enough dungeons. Ooh, you can glide. Ooh, you can climb anything. Yeah, I get it. Let me instead explain the reason why Breath of the Wild was what lived in my brain for years before I finally had to move on. This was the game that ruined other games for me for quite a while. I did two playthroughs, one on the shitty master mode even. I started the third two years after it released, but I realized then I needed to move on from this constant comparison, this absurdly high pedestal I placed Breath of the Wild on. Perhaps this is why Prey sucked me in as much as it did when I got around to it a year after it released, and possibly Rain World as well. As much as those games do a better job at providing an autonomous world for you to exist in, Breath of the Wild is a living, breathing, interactive world in ways that no other game has ever come close. Every water source conducts electricity and can be used to create ice blocks. Every fire source heats up the surrounding area in real time, meaning you can literally cook a steak on the ground of Death Mountain. Every metal object can be grabbed with a magnesis and used to bash enemies or create a bridge. Every enemy has the capability to think for themselves, grabbing items nearby, or even whipping their attack to then hit their allies. Stasis can be used in creative ways on nearly every object you come across. And finally, everything can be interacted with. Besides using them as a way to surf the sky, let's take the trees of Breath of the Wild as an example. You can climb the tree to grab an apple or eggs you found in it. You can climb it to get a higher vantage point. You can chop it down, which creates a big log, and sometimes even a Korok leaf. You can use that log to accomplish whatever evil intentions you may have, either by rolling it manually or using stasis to blast it at some poor bokoblin. You can chop that log once more to get wood. Wood can then be sold, used for a few side quests, or to make fire. That fire can be used to melt blocks of ice you find, keep yourself warm in the cold, cook an apple or two, and even create an updraft. I hope you can see what I mean with this example. There are so many gameplay opportunities that come about from simply finding one of the many regular trees in the world. While the big trunked ones you can't chop down, you can still climb them for the advantages I mentioned at the beginning of the example. The climbing itself is something almost universally loved, but I think it's worth pointing out the reason it's so enchanting is it sparks that freedom mindset most other games lock away. I'm not here to criticize other games for not allowing me to climb every building and tree I see, but because Breath of the Wild lets me do it, a switch gets flipped in my brain, allowing me to see this once stilted game world as something more real. When I was a kid, I used to fantasize about the future of video games, and in my mind, there would eventually be a game where you can do anything. 
My juvenile self went straight to the idea of peeing on a wall in an alley, because of course it did. While you can't take a piss wherever you like, you can interact with the world in so many ways, both in a fantastical fashion, but also a mundane one. There's just as much value in my eyes in being able to bake an apple by tossing it near a fire you created yourself, as there is in taking down a Lionel while utilizing every weapon, shield, power, and resource you have. The contrast is what makes it feel like you're having a real adventure, as you get to experience both sides of it. This is why the inventory screen being an infinite healing tool is a letdown, as well as being able to change clothes on a moment's notice, and being able to fast travel no matter the circumstance. If those three issues were fixed, it would emulate the feeling of being on a grand adventure all the more, but even still, Breath of the Wild is a masterpiece, and that's literally the only time I've ever said that word on this channel. I think. Those are all the games that made it to my top 25 list, but there are quite a few honorable mentions. Tekken 7 is a great fighting game that got me much more interested in the genre, and you can even play as a panda. A Hat in Time is an adorable 3D platformer that does a lot of cool things, Rhyme is a great emotional allegory to grief, and is in my opinion far better than Gris. Little Nightmares is a fun, but also terrifying little horror adventure, and in my opinion is far better than Inside. Steam World Dig 2 keeps the winning formula of the first game by allowing the player to dig and upgrade their character, even providing some new upgrades. The soundtrack is pretty good as well, and the town theme is what I'm playing right now. Battle Chasers Night War is another one of the turn-based RPGs I happen to play, and its cartoony art style and fun characters made it a pretty great experience. Mario Rabbids was far better than anyone had likely expected, and its tactical RPG gameplay is solid enough to satisfy fans of the genre. Ukulele may not have lived up to many people's expectations, but it was still a fun 3D platformer in its own right, and got much better as it went on. Night in the Woods is a charming story of a girl coming home after a failed stint with college, and the amount of wholesome care put into this game is lovely, from its dialogue, story, character and world design, and of course the tiny bits of gameplay that feel like minigames, like grabbing a can of soda from a vending machine. The soundtrack is amazing, and of course one of the standout tracks is what I used in the intro of this video. Snake Pass is a one-of-a-kind snake platformer, and not only is it fun in its own right, it's what kicked off me creating videos on this channel. 2017 was a fantastic year for game releases. So many phenomenal AAA and indie titles alike came out that year. In fact, four of my first six videos were 2017 games. Pretty wild how much this year has inspired me. There are also plenty of games I don't have much interest in, but were huge for a lot of people. Sonic Mania, Yakuza 0, Total Warhammer 2, Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, Uncharted Lost Legacy, Destiny 2, Injustice 2, Evil Within 2, Wolfenstein 2, Getting Over It, South Park The Fractured Butthole, Assassin's Creed Origins, Danganronpa 3, Thimbleweed Park, and many, many more, I'm sure. Like I said, this was a gigantic year for video games for basically every fanbase. Lastly, there are still quite a few 2017 games I haven't played much of yet, but I'm still very interested in and have high hopes for. Those being Gravity Rush 2, The Long Dark, Sexy Brutal, Divinity Original Sin 2, Slime Rancher, Tacoma, Tooth and Tail, Battle Chef Brigade, Styx Shards of Darkness, and Horizon Zero Dawn. I just really wish she'd stop fucking talking every 10 seconds and maybe I can enjoy the goddamn game. Anyway, who knows, maybe one of them could eclipse one of my top 10. If you think that's unrealistic, that very thing did happen with Resident Evil 7. I finally got around to it at the end of 2021, and I couldn't believe how long this near-perfect game was just sitting there, waiting for me to be ready for it. I wouldn't be surprised at all if one of the games I mentioned leapfrogs in the rankings. A huge shout-out to Table 53, Pixel A Day, Drew Doodle, Dave Talks Video Games, and Mandalore Gaming for taking part in this video of mine. All of their channels should be linked in either the cards at the top right of the screen, the description, and or the pinned comment down below. If you haven't yet already, go check out their channels as well. With how much work it took to put this video together, I don't know if I could have pushed on if I didn't have these folks taking over for a few of the games. Truly, thank you so much, you made this really fun. Shout out to my Patreon supporters as well, the number is growing, oh baby. Thanks for the continued support, and lastly, thanks to all of you for watching this far into the video. Like, comment, subscribe, share, join the Patreon. Alright, now get off my lawn, you dang millennials.